Imagine you have two friends who are obsessed with crime, murder, mayhem, and unsolved mysteries. They have a passion for breaking down cases that have been cold for years. Well, welcome to Generation Y, a podcast where hosts Aaron and Justin give their startling theories, dive into forensic evidence, and share their bold opinions. They dig deep looking for answers on cases of missing spouses, mysterious murders, serial killers, and more. One of the newest episodes tells the story of Jody, who was murdered on her way to meet her boyfriend, Luke. And because Luke discovered her body, he was a person of interest. Throughout the trial, he insisted that he was innocent, yet was still sentenced to a minimum of 20 years. Was he telling the truth? Or is he actually the murderer? In another chilling episode, Peter Bergner's truck crashed off a cliff near Reno. His wife, Renette, died but Peter survived. Was it an accident or did he intentionally crash? Generation Y reviews every detail of these cases to uncover the truth. And what I really loved about Generation Y is just how relaxed and cozy the vibe the hosts Aaron and Justin give. The atmosphere that they provide while looking into the cases that they dive into is really easy listening which made the information of the cases super easy to absorb as they unpack everything in a really digestible format. Which was the other noteworthy strength to this podcast. The choices for the cases that they choose to work through are really interesting and they instantly had me hooked. I personally will be listening to more for sure. So, listen to the Generation Y podcast on Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, or listen one week early and ad-free by joining Wondery Plus in the Wondery app. So my husband dated a beauty queen title holder of a well-known pageant before me. They broke up long before we met, but she was a statuesque blonde, very tall, a knockout in her day, in my opinion anyway. But this is something important to the story, I guess. While she was a, a dazzling pageant winner on the outside, on the inside, oh boy. She could be charming and beautiful if she needed you, but mostly... She just treated people around her terribly, including my husband, and he eventually broke it off with her. But she just never really went away. She would continue to call and email repeatedly, even after my husband and I met. If anything, her calls increased, in fact. She would call over and over again, day and night, even after my husband, then boyfriend, blocked her number. She would ask for money and threaten to go to the police claiming that he abused her if he didn't give it to her. He obviously did not give her the money and this made her very upset. The threats increased and became more malicious but when that didn't work she would switch tactics and try and sweetly ask him for help with certain projects that she was trying to get off the ground. At this point she now needed to generate an income. With the promise, too, that if he did just this one last thing for her, she would go away. He didn't reply. She would go back to being malicious, any tactic for attention, I suppose, or for what she really wanted, money. But my husband, he was terrified, because of course, while he never actually did anything to her, it would be her word over his, and he was terrified of ruining his reputation and career. We uh, unfortunately ended up in an event that she also attended. She'd been waiting for us to arrive and had placed herself near the entrance of the event. As we walked in, she stood across the room, looking me up and down and sort of laughing and whispering into the ear of her date, making a point to try and make me uncomfortable. But that was okay. She was easily ignored until, well, she ambushed me as I came out of the bathroom. She had clearly been waiting for a moment that I was alone. She towered over me too. She was very tall. I had no intention of having it out with her or anything, and as I hurriedly walked to find my husband, she kept pace beside me, hunched over, so she was at my eye level. I'm 5'5". Five five. Her head was also turned towards me. She was like a caricature of herself as she ambled beside me, smiling sort of maniacally. Where's your man? She hissed in her heavy accent. 
Her eyes were black and she looked like out of a Tim Burton movie, hunched over with that crazy demonic smile. Watch your back, pug, she added, grinning. She liked to call me names like pug because I own pugs and I guess she thought that this was an insult. What I didn't know then was while I was in the bathroom, she had walked over to my husband and had thrown her arms around him while he was in mid-conversation with someone and introduced herself to the man that he was talking to as if she and my husband were together. My husband unwrapped himself from her clutches and told her to beat it. She then beelined and waited for me to come out of the washroom. But we uh, stopped going to the parties after this. The last time that we ran into her though was at a funeral for a mutual friend. She followed me around at the wake and as my husband, boyfriend at the time, was talking to the man's widow, I was talking to a friend and his wife. She walked right up and stood with us, joining us mid-conversation as if she were part of the group or something. It was unnerving but also just really bizarre I guess. I mean it was a funeral and I didn't want to make a scene. So I silently picked up my wine glass off the bar and walked away, leaving her with the couple that I'd been speaking to and her staring at me with a smirk on her face. All in all, it was really annoying, but it was manageable, I guess. However, the emails, calls, they never stopped. She would call my husband over and over, day and night, even though he had long blocked her number. She would even drive by I found my car keyed one night after I left it outside too, but obviously I couldn't really prove that it was her. But enough was enough at this point. My husband had a lawyer send a cease and desist, and after the first, she called him from a private number. He answered, and she said, Hi, it's me, in a sort of sing-song voice, like they were the best of friends, and he hadn't just sent her a lawyer's letter ordering her to stay away from him and he his family. He said nothing and hung up though and another cease and desist was sent, and then a third. And nothing would make her go away it seemed though. I guess she just did not actually think that my husband was capable of not wanting to be with her because, you know, her beauty and all. Eventually though, she got really ticked off that he was not giving in. So she decided to take this rage to the internet. I knew that she was absolutely checking out my social media, but I don't really use it that much, so I didn't care. However, she created a fake Twitter account and tweeted, my husband's name is a fraud, and tagged his colleagues, friends, investors, family members, every single person that she could think of to try and ruin his reputation and career. On New Year's Eve, she posted on my Instagram account at exactly 12.01am, Happy New Year's scrud. Social media settings were all put to private though. We went to the police armed with emails threatening to give her money or she would go to the police and she was charged with two counts of harassment and a restraining order was put into place. To our shock though, the next day after her arrest, our phones were buzzing. This story had made front page news. Clearly it was a slow news day, right? Well, her day in court came right before COVID. We arrived to the courthouse and sort of sat down and she walked in. And we were shocked by her appearance. Actually, shocked is probably an understatement. She was unrecognizable from her former self. Gone was the statuesque dazzling blonde. She had apparently shaved her head and was wearing a short ratty brown wig. She had gained about 80 pounds, give or take and was now sort of hunched. With her height and new girth, she looked like a linebacker if I'm being honest. She wore a bulky brown overcoat and a scarf tied over her wig like a babushka. My immediate thought though was her outside now matches her inside, but it was her eyes that I noticed the most. About a year earlier, we had shown a photo of her to our kids so that if she ever approached them, they knew to run. At the time, my son, who was young, commented that she had mean eyes. From the mouth of babes, right? Maybe it was that she had changed so much physically overall, but her eyes were dark and narrowed into deep sort of black slits. As she scanned the courtroom and saw us in court, she would turn around every so often to look back at us and glare. 
She would then whisper in her lawyer's ear and laugh as if as she were having a grand time. We thought that she was putting on a brave face and treating it all like a joke, but we were about to find out that getting arrested would not slow her down. The restraining order didn't seem to face her at all. If anything, I think it just angered her even more. But from then on, every day and night, she would post from multiple fake social media accounts, posting photos of myself, of my husband. She would put up my husband's photos with captions of pedophile or other terrible names. She posted altered and unflattening photos of myself. She called me old and ugly. Those are the G-rated ones too, mind you. And listen, I'm definitely no beauty queen myself. The name calling, while obsessive and gross, wasn't what bothered me most to be honest. Although, I'm not going to lie, seeing hundreds of photos of myself on her fake Twitter account calling me ugly and obsessively pointing out every single perceived flaw did succeed in getting me down at times. But why did I keep looking? Because it was like getting a glimpse into her unraveled mind just in case it was a clue of what she was capable or thinking of doing next. Because it wasn't her insulting post that fazed me. What bothered me most were the sinister captions. Like, keep an eye on your kids because I'm watching. Or, why don't you plant some flowers in your front garden? Or, be good to your kids because you never know what could happen. How was your Uber Eats order? She would post pictures of me with an arrow directed to my head, which I perceived to be a gun to my head. She posted pictures of my husband's workplace, which she was not allowed to be near, in accordance to the restraining order, but the police said that this could just be a picture that she took from the internet. Right. She posted Agatha Christie quotes like, every killer is usually someone you know well, or your end is near. Her Twitter profile banner picture was taken from a movie poster and said stalker, like she was in on the joke. We called the police again, but they said that there wasn't anything that they could do since she didn't actually tag us. I took screenshots of everything. Many of her posts were just nonsensical, but most were photos posted of us on this fake account, all altered with derogatory or ominous captions. But still, we just couldn't shut her down. I became anxious anytime my kids were outside shooting hoops in the driveway. My elderly mother wouldn't take the baby out in the stroller. She was too scared. It really affected all of our lives. Like, became dramatic. Ex-beauty queen would taunt us with catch me if you can. She posted close-ups of her dog's genitals or a piece of her dog's turds with my name beside it. The implication obvious. It really bothered me too that she now had a dog since I didn't think someone like her was capable of caring for anything living. But then the call started back up. This time to our home line. Yes, we still have a home line. We're one of those people. She would say nasty things and then just hang up. She would say things like karma will get you and then weird chant like calls as if she was reciting a spell. Sure enough, she posted photos of a pentagram and candles as some sort of altar and the caption ring ring. But finally too, finally the police asked us to come in and give video statements. We gave them a drive containing thousands of screenshots of posts that she had made and they arrested her again and charged her with two more counts of criminal harassment. My husband was angry at this point, but as a mama bear, I just wanted to get this over with. She mentioned the kids frequently and ominously many times in her online rants, also calling them rude names, which I won't repeat here because these are the things that upset me the most. The judge also issued a social media ban for her. By the time that she was rearrested for the second time, her fake Twitter account, which was literally mostly insults or references to my family, had 16,000 tweets in a three-month period. She has no followers, mind you, so they were just to herself. The adult sites I had been continuously being tagged on stopped, thankfully. The things quieted down tremendously, but I still get follower requests that I believe are her. But at this point, we were all on edge. And I kid you not, I felt weird walking into my kitchen at night to make a sandwich, feeling creeped out that she was outside watching or something. 
Uh, I put nothing past her, as nothing is more dangerous than a desperate woman who has nothing to lose, right? Which, by the way, was one of the quotes that she posted. I don't know what is wrong with her. I believe from what I've researched that she's a malignant narcissist. Or perhaps some other mental issues at play here, but I can say that she was a terrible person long before she decided to try and make her, our lives miserable. Crazy beauty queen turned stalker. Uh, I would love nothing more than to never see you again, but if going to court helps you stay away from us forever, then bring it, I suppose. As an aside, I wanted to mention that we've heard from a reliable source that after my husband broke up with her, she allegedly became known to the police for other reasons too. What I mean is that while my husband dodged a bullet regarding her threats to go to the police saying that he abused her, apparently other men have not been so lucky. Around May 2019, I became sort of oddly obsessed with the paranormal. I read a ton of books, Amy Deville Horror, and all of the Ed and Lorraine Warren books too. And it was through this obsession with the paranormal that I learned of a supposedly satanic castle in my local area. Firstly though, I live in a county in Scotland that is dotted with a few large towns and a lot more villages. There's nothing much to do around here, but there's a lot of great places to explore, I suppose. I usually go cycling with a friend, if the sun's out, that is, and that's how we always get to the castle. I don't know how old the castle is, to be honest, although articles say sometime around the 1200s. The castle itself is hidden deep in the forest and is pretty tough to find. So far, as I know anyway... There are three ways to get to the castle, two of which require you to trudge through a lot of mud and crisscross your way down a pretty steep slope. But when you reach the castle, the first thing you'll see is the larger tower-like structure protruding through the trees. Below is a stone archway, which is usually home to a makeshift fireplace, which I'm guessing people use when they camp here. Beyond that is a towering stone wall, and below that are two iron gratings, which give a view into the chamber. A set of stone steps lead down to the gratings. If you pass through a small archway in the wall and follow the path down, you'll get to a small entrance which you'll need to sort of crouch through to get into the chamber. Passing through a small corridor will bring you to the cathedral-like chamber itself, and standing towards the gratings on the left is a stone stairway that winds down until you come to a blocked-off wall. Now, this is where it gets a little weird, but bear with me. The castle was supposedly built by a necromancer, who made a deal with the devil to summon an army of goblins to build the castle itself. As such, many burned out candles can be found in the chamber with a lot of sinister messages written on the wall. Me and my friend cycled a lot here in May of 2019 and there were a few odd occurrences. The first I remember was when I was standing at the gratings outside the chamber. I heard a sort of sharp whistle behind me but... When I turned around, there was nobody there. This obviously could have been a bird, but just swooped down behind me, but it still spooked me a little bit, I have to admit. The second time, me and my friend were coming up to the castle when we heard what sounded like children playing, but the castle was completely deserted. It's worth noting too that the castle is on a hill of sorts. Down the hill is a river that winds through the forest, and if there were people there... They would have had to have come our way, and we definitely would have seen them if they went down the hill. The third oddity, though, me and my friend brought a bunch of candles and matches to take some photos of the illuminated chamber. We lit one and then carried it through the corridor and set it in the chamber. We repeated this process about three times, and on the fourth candle, we heard a sort of large hiss coming from inside the chamber, almost as if a large anaconda was in there or something. And man, that terrified me. Especially when we ran and we thought that all the dry leaves in the chamber had caught fire. I ran in, but when I did, the candles were still flickering and nothing was on fire. Me and my friend still occasionally cycled to the castle. Nothing strange has happened for a while now, but... I feel like the whistle can be easily explained. 
The voices as we came up to the castle, then seeing that there was nothing in there is a little tougher. But the hiss is what I have the most trouble rationalizing. It was really loud and it definitely sounded more than just like leaves or something. I've been there and I just cannot figure out what it was. And that really troubles me. So, this is a story that I haven't really told anyone. Partly because elements of the story are just well, not really appropriate in most social situations. And as a result, I've locked this away in my memory and I rarely think about it. Also, as a, a bit of a disclaimer, I'm completely aware that this story involves me being very stupid and careless. I'm not going to inject these acknowledgements into the story, but rest assured that in hindsight, I'm aware of the foolishness that took place and I don't need to be chided on the topic. So, the year was about 1998 to 1999. I was a young gay guy in my early 20s, living in a medium-sized city in the Midwestern US. This was a sort of an in-between, a transitional time for gay people, where in most populous areas we had enough respect to live openly, but there were still plenty of people who just didn't like us. It was also well before the invention of smartphones and the internet was still in the early stages of mass adoption. There were large communities online, but it wasn't yet at the point where most Americans were online. In fact, online socialization consisted of chat rooms hosted by various services like AOL, Yahoo, or IRC servers, and message boards were still used by large numbers of people, but not as much as today. For gay men at that time, though, it was nothing short of revolutionary. Prior to the internet, and to the broader cultural changes, of course, gay men had been stuck looking for fun in secretive and or shady places due to the inability to freely express ourselves. In the 90s, it was still somewhat risky, but the internet offered a way to talk freely and relatively anonymously, without the risk of being outed or worse. For this reason too, it really took off in the gay communities, and gay men were a very large part of the user bases for these social platforms. It was suddenly very easy and relatively safe too to find dates, friends, or even just a good time, and it quickly became the norm for a lot of gay men. On the other hand, being such a new communication tool for most people, we were sometimes blind to the risks, I guess you could say. Anyway, being an attractive young man in my prime, I made liberal use of the online communities to find dates. This is to say, I had plenty of hookups. My city had a decent number of chat rooms and personal message boards, and I had mostly great experiences. I met the typical assortment of good guys, closet cases, and a few weirdos too, like you'd expect. It wasn't an absolute hoe by most standards, but suffice it to say that a cute gay guy at that time could generally have a lot more dates than your typical straight person. But at some point during this time, I had some brief chat on a message board with a guy from my city. I forget his screen name, I mean it's been like over 20 years, but let's call him Slim Guy 65 so this back and forth had happened on a general thread in the gay section, not in private message boards or anything, so it was visible to anyone who chose to read the thread. Nothing had come of it, but about a week later I had received an email from an unrecognized address. The email basically said, hey I'm not gay and I don't agree with the gay lifestyle, I'm here because my friend met this guy, slim guy 65 person from this message board, and the guy really hurt him. I don't want this to happen to anyone else. My friend tried to tell the police, but they wouldn't do anything. I see that you were talking to Slim Guy 65 so just be careful and stay away from him. Okay, I thought, that's strange. What does this person mean by really hurt him too? Was his heart broken? Did he get beaten up or verbally abused or something? I responded to the email asking for clarification on what exactly happened, but... I never really received a response. I must admit too that I, I was slightly weirded out by it for sure. But on the other hand, it's an anonymous email from someone who doesn't respond and is vague about their warning. This really could be anything, right? It could be some disgruntled ex trying to mess with the guy. It could be a real warning about someone gay bashing or something. It could be someone trolling who doesn't have anything to do with anyone. But I kept it in the back of my mind pretty much shrugged it off in the end, but 
It just still sort of niggled away at me. Several weeks later though, I had a weekday off work and decided to take to the internet to fish for some, well, you know what, as was my custom. But lo and behold, I had an email response to a personal ad, and it was SlimGuy65. He was offering to meet at this place to hang out and just have a good time. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. I won't go into the details, of course, but as I recall, there weren't really many details discussed other than the small talk and intros that we'd done previously. Nothing about this guy was really sounding interesting to me, but I had no other offers on this day, so I decided, well, why not? I'll go see what this dude is about. But as I typed my reply, I suddenly remembered the strange email that I'd received warning about this person. I went back and read it, still vague, still presenting more questions than answers. Should I take this anonymous warning at face value and just ignore this guy? I decided to go check him out anyway. His address was on a rather busy street in the middle of a dense residential area, not some back of the woods shack or something, and I could handle myself. I thought to myself that if he's weird, then I can just get out of there. But before long, I arrived at the house at the agreed time. It was a duplex style house with one apartment on the ground floor and one on the second floor, a part of a row of several identical duplexes. It was the middle of the afternoon by the time that I got there. There was plenty of traffic on the street and the occasional person out on their porch or in their backyard. I pulled up to the driveway to the parking area behind the house, got out and knocked on the door. The guy that answered was a pretty normal, kind of mousy looking man, probably in his late 40s. Slight, slim build, soft spoken, looked like any guy working in an office, a cubicle maybe somewhere. Not really my type, but honestly my curiosity was piqued and I had nothing better to do anyway, so I stepped inside to take a look around and gauge the situation. With the warning email fresh in my mind, of course. I stepped into the back door, into the kitchen. It was very clean, and there was nothing out on the counters, and no table and chairs, or anything. This is to say that it didn't look like somebody was living there, to be honest. It looked like it had been kept up and cleaned, but for the most part it looked empty. Looking out into the apartment, I could see that it was not set up as a, a living space. A large window with sliding glass was between the kitchen and the living room and I could see what looked like a large table out in the living room area. And then SG65 said something like, this isn't where I live, a friend of mine used to run a doctor's office here and I maintain the building for him. It's private though and we have the place to ourselves, which I know was a bit weird but okay I guess. He shut the back door and locked it, with a key deadbolt, the kind that you need a key to open, even from the inside and put his key back into his pocket saying, so what do you want to do? Upon seeing this too, my danger sense definitely spiked. This is not a normal home, and why was he locking the door like that? It's not necessarily suspect, I suppose. A lot of people have that sort of lock on their door, and the door actually has a window too, so it even made some sense, I suppose. But still, something just wasn't right here, and I could tell but now I was locked in. I asked him straight up too why he was locking the door like that, which immediately flustered him. He was looking rather nervous and his voice was a little wavery and halting, not quite stuttering, but almost, I suppose. He said, uh, um, well, we don't want someone to come in and interrupt us, right? Flashing a weak and unconvincing smile. His demeanor and body language were all I needed to confirm that this guy was definitely up to no good, or at least there was something that he was hiding. However, I could tell that I was intimidating him. I was not a particularly muscular kid or anything, but I had a pretty large frame. Like, even when I'm at my very thinnest, I still wear large size tops and 36 waist pants, so I look pretty big, which people tend to interpret as me being stronger than I probably really am. Also, I am definitely not a tough guy at all, but I have a resting facial expression that makes me look like um, a bit of a thug, I suppose. In fact, people who don't know me often assume that I'm rough or something. I sometimes use this to my advantage too while I can because, well, before long a new acquaintance will eventually figure out that I'm a total wimp. But this was definitely an occasion to play up the tough guy appearance and I did exactly that. 
I put my best steely face on and I told him to unlock the door and that I didn't want to be locked in here like this. He looked for a moment like he was going to pee his pants and then he said, Okay, alright, I'll unlock this. And he unlocked the deadbolt. And then, I'll just lock the knob here, okay? He turned the little dial that locks the doorknob. That was fine with me, to be honest. I continued to stare at him until he said, I'll leave the keys on the counter right here. And he set the keys down near the sink. I was relatively satisfied with this answer, to be honest. At this point, though, my adrenaline was definitely flowing. I was almost in full flight or fight mode, but I was kind of stuck in place. The guy was now between me and the door, though, and I was freaked out, but this little weasel didn't appear to pose any immediate physical threat to me. I could tell that his pants pockets were empty, too, and that I was intimidating him now, but still, I didn't know exactly what to do. Now, keep in mind that despite my wordy descriptions, this all happened very quickly without any real sort of long pauses. It had only been maybe one or two minutes since I had stepped into the door by this point, and this all happened at the pace of a conversation. I was obviously nervous and trying not to appear so. He said, well, let's go in, and walked a wide path around me through the kitchen into what would normally be the living room, and toward the hall to the right from there. I was familiar with this floor layout, it's pretty common in this area. The hallway would lead up to two small bedrooms, with a bathroom in between them. But I sort of hesitated, thinking that I should just walk out that back door and take off. But really, now I was super curious. I mean, I knew there was no way in heck that I'm doing anything with this guy at this point, but I kind of want to see what's going on in here. Also, I was pretty confident that I could take him if it came to a fight, so I slowly headed toward the living room. I remember it feeling like I was walking in slow motion, and from the kitchen entrance I could see large rectangular stainless steel tables taking up a lot of the living room. I remember thinking too that this looks a lot like a surgical table. In fact, it looked like it could rise and tilt, and it also had a recessed channel running all the way around the edge. In hindsight, I now know what that was. It was 100% a mortician's table. The dude had a mortician's table in there. But at that time, I just thought like it looked like a weird medical table of some sort. There were some other office typey sort of cabinets too and stuff around, I think, but now all I really remember is that table in that room. And then I noticed that the large front window looking out onto the street was covered by vertical blinds that were closed. SG65 said something like, uh, this used to be a doctor's office, like I said, come on back here. The hallway revealed the room setup that I expected. The first bedroom was closed, the second bedroom was open to a small, very clean bathroom. At the end of the hall was the other bedroom, which looked like, if the doctor's office story was true, had at one time been converted to an exam room. He said, well, we can go into that room if you want, go ahead, take a look. And he stayed by the other closed bedroom door. The back bedroom door was open and I could see that the walls were covered in a sort of honey coloured wood panelling, the type you might see in a den or an office that hasn't been updated since like the 1970s. I slowly took a few steps down to that door, trying to be very aware of what Mr. Creepy was doing behind me, but he didn't move. When I got up to that room though, the first thing that I noticed was the door had a sort of key deadbolt lock, like the back door, but this room, it locked from the outside. I wondered if there was a lever on the inside or something, but I pretty much knew the answer to that question without needing to check, because I also saw a chair, a non-swiveling plastic desk chair with sort of thin metal legs sitting near the center of the room. The room had old dark carpet and those wood paneled walls like I mentioned, and I noticed that the walls were completely paneled with no windows. And I know that the room had at least one window, probably two, so whoever did that panelling went over those windows for sure. And there was also a phone in there plugged in and sitting on the floor. It was an old office phone, probably from around the 80s or early 90s. Dingy sort of beige plastic with several buttons to manage different phone lines. Just sitting on the carpet near the wall, with the chair at a slight distance facing the phone. 
And apart from that, there was nothing else in that room. I was sort of standing at the threshold of the room with one foot slightly in, absolutely not going past that door. And I looked back at the dude. He was still standing by the other door, just nervously smiling at me, trying hard to look casual, I suppose, but obviously very nervous. Or something. He said something like, well, what do you want to do? But instead of answering, I felt around the backside of the deadbolt lock. And sure enough, there was nothing there but the smooth wood of the door. It also dawned on me that I didn't see a light switch anywhere for the ceiling lamp. And where was the switch? Who knows? It should have been just inside the door, of course, but that original switch was covered up by the paneling now. He mumbled something about not having the key to that lock. Don't worry about it. I turned back to face the guy and just said, What is it that you want to do here? My skin had gone ice cold at this point as I realized that I was way, way too far into this apartment. In fact, it was at this point that I was running through my options in my head. What was this guy going to do? He doesn't appear to have any weapon or anything in reach, but who knows what goes on in this place? And what are you trying to do? That last part too, I actually said out loud, and he was almost totally derailed by that. He stammered out, uh, some hot man-to-man's uh, -man fun stuff, with the weakest smile that I've ever seen, looking like he was just a hair's breadth away from fully panicking. I know too that it sounds a bit comical, but really, at that time, that sentence was probably the most chilling part of the entire experience for me. It was just the way that he said it, like he had come up with something on the fly, like something that would sound plausible, but yet he failed. And I mean, who says that in real life? Hey, do you want to have some hot man-to-man -man fun? <sighs> Nobody, right? It's sort of like something you might say for a cheesy advertisement for an inappropriate site or something like that. Some hot man-to-man -man fun. <sighs> Gross, right? Anyway, that was it. I said to him, no, I just want to go and I'm leaving. And he said, oh, okay. I quickly walked past him as he flattened himself against the wall to avoid me and I noped right out of that living room dissection area and through the kitchen to the back door, which thankfully still had not been deadbolted. The keys were still on the counter and I let myself out the door and I didn't bother closing that as I saw him slowly coming to the door behind me. I deliberately walked out, not ran, to my car and looking back at the building I can see that indeed... There was actually a window facing the backyard area from that panelled room, but of course it was covered up from the inside. And the dude was shutting and locking the back door. Truthfully, in the end, too, I left with my heart pounding, my skin icy cold, my heart in my throat thinking, what the heck was that? So, was this guy some kind of a killer or was he just an awkward closeted gay guy? with access to a sterile looking apartment with an autopsy mortuary table and a windowless room that locks from the outside but with a chair and a phone and no light switch. It's clear to me that the poor soul who walks into that room probably gets locked in there and then he shuts off the light from somewhere and calls the phone. But other than that, it's anyone's guess what actually happened. I assume that the friend of the judgmental person who emailed me must have been some kid that got locked in there for whatever game and shoes. But driving home at first I thought, of course I have to call the police and tell them what's in this place. But thinking it through, I realized that I didn't really have any crime to tell them about. I mean, what do I say? I went to meet a man for some casual fun and what? I mean, he has a room with a chair in it. He has, as I thought at the time, an exam table. The, pol the police aren't going to do anything with that story. The guy didn't touch me or do anything to me, and in the end, I just left. I considered calling an anonymous tip line, but again, what exactly would I report? There was no actionable crime, and also keep in mind that at that time, while the local police in the city were pretty decent, they, they weren't especially interested in getting involved with helping gays. They'd prosecute actual crimes if it was cut and dry, of course, but 
I'd heard plenty of accounts of them not choosing to follow up on cases where there was not an easy arrest to be made. And so, in the end, I decided not to report anything because nothing would come of it, except perhaps drawing unwanted attention to myself. And you know what? Even in retrospect, I honestly think that that was probably the most rational choice to make. If this happened today in 2020, the law enforcement would probably be a, a lot more interested in it, but back then, not so much. And so, live and learn, right? I still drove past that house once in a while in the normal course of life for like several years, and I'd always pay attention to how it looked. The vertical blinds were closed for maybe five or six years whenever I went past, and then eventually the blinds were down and there were decorative curtains in the window, so I assumed that the place was eventually sold to someone who actually lived in it. But around 2002, maybe 2003, there was actually a murder of a young guy on the news. He'd been found in the next state, which borders on my city. It's not very far away. I recognized the guy from the gay community too, but didn't know him personally. And a friend mentioned to me something about this local serial killer. I said, what? And he explained that a few young men had gone missing over the past year, each after being at one specific drive bar, and each being found several miles to the north past the state line, and also out in the country. And the case on the news actually matched up with that M.O. My friend told me that the young guy had been at that bar and left with someone the night that he disappeared, and the news report didn't mention anything about a gay bar or similar recent cases, of course, but I had to wonder if my acquaintance from the internet had something to do with it. The location of the murders apparently were nowhere near that duplex, at least according to the story that I was told, but I never heard of a resolution to that murder on the news or any official mention of a suspected serial killer, other than some gossip of course. And so, in the end, I am just left scratching my head.